Okay, welcome to today's webinar, OpenMC Neutronic Simulations of CAD-Based Geometry Using DAGMC and Coreform Qubit. So this is a webinar we've been looking forward to putting on for quite some time. I'm Matt Sederberg from Coreform, and Patrick Shreeweiss from Argon uh, will be doing the demonstration part of the webinar today. So the agenda today is we will first introduce you to the software packages Coreform, Qubit, DAGMC, and OpenMC. Then Patrick will do workflow demonstrations showing how to do OpenMC Neutronics through this workflow with an example both from nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Then there'll be time for questions and answers at the end. This webinar is recorded throughout the webinar. If you have questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A and we'll either answer, answer them offline during the webinar or um, answer them at the end. So to introduce Coreform Qubit, uh, Coreform Qubit is used across industries for advanced meshing for challenging simulations. There's a lot of reasons why uh, engineers use Qubit. Some of the, its strengths are being able to import CAD directly from multiple file formats and clean it up. It has some of the best hex meshing around. There's a lot of control over mesh quality and properties. Many people use Qubit for scripting and they like its tight Python integration. And also there's flexible licensing available with Qubit. Uh, we work closely with Cindy National Labs who develop the Qubit code for government use. Um, we sell Qubit for commercial use. And we also have a free version of Coreform Qubit that's available for hobby and student usage. And we recently added in November of this year support for OpenMC and MC, MCNP workflows um, for Neutronics. That's what we'll be demonstrating today. Um, so let me turn the time over to Patrick now. And before the, I do that, I'll just introduce him briefly. So Patrick Shreewise is an assistant computational scientist at Argonne National Laboratory. He develops and performs research with OpenMC and is also an active developer of the DAGMC toolkit. And he received his PhD in nuclear engineering and engineering physics at the University of Wisconsin. So let me hand off to you now, Patrick. Thanks, Matt. And thanks for inviting me today to come do this webinar. And thanks to everybody who's joined online. Uh, I'm just going to go over a couple of the different tools and capabilities that we'll be talking about today. So the first being the DAGMC toolkit or the Direct Accelerated Geometry for Monte Carlo toolkit. Um, its purpose is to enable geometry queries on CAD-based tessellations of a CAD model. Um, so this provides a, a way to translate uh, an incoming CAD model into a surface tessellation that we can perform particle transport on in a number of different Monte Carlo codes that we interface with listed on the right hand side of the slide here. And its real purpose, so the role that it fills is um, it eliminates this need in a higher level design iteration to translate an incoming CAD model from the CAD engineering team into the native constructive solid geometry or CSG that's supported in uh, pretty ubiquitously across most Monte Carlo codes. And so DAGMC provides this workflow going from a CAD model to this generalized surface tessellation. Uh, there are some ceiling operations involved, and then it provides the geometry query and ray tracing, underlying ray tracing algorithms um, to perform the particle transport and simulation. One of those codes that it um, interacts with and that I, as Matt mentioned, I work on is OpenMC. And so I'll just talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Yeah, but before transitioning, I should note that the DAGMC functionality has been available in Core from Qubit as a plugin for several years. And just in this last release of Core from Qubit, we've integrated this natively, which is part of the motivation for the webinar. Yeah, that's a good point, Matt. Thanks. Um, and so we'll be focusing on working with DAGMC in OpenMC. So we'll be preparing models for DAGMC models for OpenMC and doing a couple of demonstration simulations uh, today with that code. OpenMC is an open source Monte Carlo particle transport code. Uh, it uses modern programming interfaces with C, uh, C++ and Python. We'll be interfacing with it through Python today for convenience. Uh, it has its own set of nuclear data interfaces and internal representation of those. Depletion can be performed as well through OpenMC along with a number of other kind of niche operations and um, we have a primary focus within OpenMC on high-performance computing support for the code. 
So today we're going to be walking through a couple of different examples, as Matt mentioned. Um, and the idea here is we're going to be trying to convey some information about this integrated capability for DAGMC model generation in Qubit. Uh, so we'll be going through some of the standard operations that one will uh, need to perform for preparing a model within uh, within Qubit for DAGMC. So one is going to be just building a very simple geometry. We're going to start with a pressurized water reactor thin cell. There's an equivalent model of this in OpenMC. Um, and so we'll be kind of replicating that in DAGMC and, you know, for a confidence boost, proving that we can get uh, pretty much equivalent results uh, with this tessellated version of the geometry. Uh, part of those steps in generating the model is going to be adding the metadata so that the particle transport code understands the material assignments um, uh, as it loads up this DAGMC model. We'll be do, talking about imprinting and merging to make the topology robust for particle transport. We'll be looking at the new surface meshing and remeshing capabilities, along with the ability to interactively visualize the DAGMC facets in Qubit and then export the integrated ability to export the DAGMC model to this H5M format um, that DAGMC interacts with. And then finally, we'll run the, a couple OpenMC simulations. Again, one with this pen cell, and then we'll move on to a more fusion-related example uh, with a model that was generated with the package called Paramac that's developed by Jonathan Shimlaw of First Light Fusion. All right, so with that, I will take over and start sharing my screen. So we'll be starting here with a fresh um, kind of open, freshly open or form qubit. Um, but the first thing we're really going to do is uh, take a look at uh, this PWR pen cell model in OpenMC. And so I won't spend too much time um, explaining the different pieces of the OpenMC API that I'll be using today, um, other than just to explain how we're running the code and um, a little bit on the model interrogation. But we'll start by just opening a Python interpreter here. We're going to import a couple of uh, things. So first off, OpenMC itself. And then we'll import uh, this matplotlib tool that if you're a Python user doing visualization, you're probably very familiar with. So OpenMC provides a couple of demonstration models. One of these is a just a simple PWR pen cell. Um, it was shown in the slides. It's a pretty simple geometry. Uh, but to start, we'll just get an idea for what this model contains. So this, what this has provided to us is an OpenMC model object. And this model object ties together the critical components of an OpenMC input for simulation, the settings, the geometry, and the materials. And then optionally, there are other components like the uh, user-defined tallies and plots as well. So we can interrogate this model briefly and just look at what materials are part of this model. Um, there are just three different regions in here and three corresponding materials. So one is our fuel or the uranium oxide, which we can infer from the name and the composition. Uh, there's going to be cladding surrounding that fuel region. It's a zircaloid material. And then finally, outside of the cladding, there's gonna be hot chlorated water um, in that space. And so if we want to um, visualize this just briefly in OpenMC, we can do that. And we're gonna provide some colors to our plot so we can understand the geometry. Uh, so we have some intuition for this when we go to build it in Qubit. I've kind of got these commands already queued up for us. Again, just not, not so concerned with the OpenMC API today, but I would like us to be able to visualize the geometry briefly. So the CSG geometry that's defined in OpenMC, we can have a quick look at. So the innermost region is our uranium oxide. We get surrounded by a zircaloid cladding, and outside of that, it's our fluoridated water. We'll re be reproducing this model in Qubit. So we have a CSG representation of it, um, all ready to go in OpenMC. And were I to do this command, I'll clear my screen to get it to the top real quick. So were I to ask OpenMC to execute this model, it would do so with the CSG geometry. And we'll do that later on. But first, um, we just want to get a sense for the geometry that we are going to try to recreate inside of Qubit. 
So now that we have kind of an understanding of what the geometry is, let's grab some of the dimensions from this feature, the features of the geometry. Uh, we have this innermost cylinder here. So we'll go ahead and create that and cube it. It's a uh, uh, Z cylinder, so centered on the Z axis or oriented on the Z axis. On the origin with this radius specified here. And in OpenMC, all the dimensions are specified centimeters. In qubit, there's no underlying base uh, dimension. And so what any of the dimensions or parameters that we put in for the size of these objects are going to be interpreted by OpenMC as um, in centimeters. So the first thing that we'll do is go ahead and go over to our command panel, to the geometry icon, select volume, and then we're going to be creating a new volume. We'll go ahead and create a cylinder and provide this radius that we saw in our other panel, 39218. Sorry for all the window switching, try to keep that to a minimum. Um, so this is a 2D model in OpenMC, meaning that it has dimensions in the X and Y directions, but there is no uh, limit in the Z directions. That's not something that's amenable to CAD. And so we'll talk about how to apply boundary conditions um, to this model such that it's equivalent to this 2D model in CSG. Um, but for now, when we're creating these volumes, what it means is we just need to create them all uh, the same height, and it can be a pretty arbitrary height. So we'll just make them all uh, 10 units tall. So this is our first cylinder. If we go back to our geometry description, we see we have that cylinder, and then we have another one following it um, with a slightly larger radius for the outside of the cladding. And so we'll go ahead and pull that in. We'll create a new cylinder here, provide that dimension. And we see that added to the model. And then lastly, that region was surrounded by uh, two X planes and two Y planes going from negative 0.63 centimeters to 0.63 centimeters. And so we'll create an equivalent volume as well. So the width of that should go from negative 0.63 to 0.63, so 1.26 width in each direction, in X and Y, and we'll match that height of the cylinder that we just created. All right, so now if we look at these, we can see partially by the graphics facets um, here that these volumes are all overlapping. So now we need to kind of create distinct regions to represent um, each of these so that we don't have these overlapping spaces in our model. And if we look at the model tree over here, we'll see we've created three volumes, just like we've expected. We've hit the create volume button three times, so it looks good so far. Uh, and we're gonna work our way outside in when we're doing these subtractions. So we'll take volume three, which is this region here, the outermost region, and we're gonna subtract volume two out of that. We wanna keep that volume uh, for future, for future um, definition of the model. So we'll just go ahead and uh, we're going to keep volume two specifically, not both of them. We'll go ahead and apply that. And then we need to do the same things between volumes two and volumes one. So we'll subtract from volume two. We're going to subtract volume one and we'll keep volume one in the model. And so this provides us, um, you know, if I give it the right view here, this equivalent geometry that we can work with as long as we're providing the right boundary conditions. The next thing I'll talk about is a little more geometry preparation. Uh, if we look at, I will go ahead and hide if I can get my controls to, to go away. Hit it, control, no, control reactions. Oh, okay, well, um, let's see if I can. Hide floating mean controls. All right, so I'll select these couple surfaces that are on our visible side um, of the water volume. We're going to turn those off and just look at this barrel surface uh, that is the interface between the water and the outside of the cladding. We'll also look at, so that's going to be the interface between volumes two and three. We're going to examine this in the model tree a little bit. Um, so let's see if I can find the right surface that is the barrel. We see that that is labeled as surface 13 in the topology of this model. And the barrel surface for the outside of the cladding 
a Surface 4, as I have it highlighted here. Now, those are independent. And one thing that's critical for DAGMC simulation is that these surfaces become shared so that particles can be moved efficiently and robustly from volume two to volume three as they inter interact with it. So there's two steps to indicating within the geometry engine that these two surfaces, first off, should be linked and are coincident and can be merged together. And then there's the process of actually merging the surfaces together. So I typically interact with this through the uh, through the console down here. We've kind of been using the GUI so far, but we can insert this command that is imprint body all. So this is gonna detect these coincident surfaces and then link them together um, within the internal engine. Now notice that nothing's changed about our model tree here. Um, these surfaces are coincident throughout the entire span of the model, but that won't be the case in the second um, the Paramac model that we look at later, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Good. Now to go ahead and tell the geometry engine that these two surfaces are in fact the same and should be treated the same, we can go ahead and merge them. And then we, we see in the model tree here that surface four now exists in both volumes. We also see that this kind of, these graphics artifacts go away as a result of the two. So this was true for other um, surfaces in the model. There's another barrel surface that, or cylindrical surface um, between volumes one and two, and that you can see they share surface one as well. So that operation applied to those volumes. Okay, so that is a critical operation. It can be really difficult um, to have a robust simulation if the topology is not correct um, in the resulting DAGMC model. Um, and so it's a really important step to be able to, to execute. The next thing that we'll be looking at is adding metadata. So now we have a well-formed geometry or what I'll claim is a well-formed geometry. And now we're going to be adding materials. So historically, for anybody who's on the call who's a previous DAGMC user, we would indicate uh, material assignments and boundary conditions by kind of hijacking the name the naming scheme for groups uh, within Qubit. And we have now kind of a more formalized approach to assigning material assignments, which will kind of open the door to a lot of enhanced functionality down the road for defining, potentially defining materials within Qubit uh, and even executing simulations from within Qubit if we get to that point. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is go ahead and add a material. So this material we're gonna add, um, in the OpenMC workflow, material assignments can be performed either by using a material name or by a material ID. So if we go back to our material list for this model that we're working with, we saw that all of our materials are named. And so today, my preference is certainly to identify these materials by name for human readability, rather than having to kind of go and constantly look them up based on their IDs. And so if we provide the same name for this material, the fuel, serenium oxide, we'll say this is UO2, and we're indicating here it's rich to 2.4%. That doesn't, this is just part of the name. It doesn't have any bearing on the uh, material composition. So we will go ahead and create that material. We'll likewise, we'll create one for the zircaloy. And we'll create one for the hot borated water as well. Oops, I missed a, missed a D on the end of there. Don't want that to come back and bite us. So we should see these appear in the materials uh, tree. And then I can just rename that. Um, that material to the correct name. So again, I'll reiterate that uh, this is the a possible scheme for working with OpenMC. For other Monte Carlo codes, um, the material naming scheme is typically required to be an ID identification. Uh, and in many codes, some additional info is required as well. So if we were trying to assign a volume to material one in MCMP, we would also want to provide a density specification for this. Um, and the syntax for that would be to have this trailing uh, kind of delimiter, that's the forward slash, 
we would say it's a uh, density value. And then Dagum C will interpret this as a material with density um, in grams per cubic centimeter and forward that information on essentially to the code. This is just kind of due to the different ways that codes associate these material properties with regions, um, sometimes with cells or sometimes with materials in their models. So, but we'll be sticking to the OpenMC workflow today, but I'll try to capture some of those nuances um, as we go. So now that we have materials, the next thing we'll do is we need to group our volumes together into um, blocks that we could assign these materials to. In this case, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between volumes and materials, um, so it's not terribly interesting. But in the second example, we'll see a little bit of how that can be set up with multiple volumes assigned to one material. So we're going to create a new block here. So I selected this um, kind of blocky object and then create uh, the block ID and name is not particularly relevant in this case. It's really about the fact that we're going to be assigning uh, the material to these groups of volumes. And so if I go through, I'm going to be selecting volumes to go in this block. To say the first block is going to contain volume one. The second block is going to contain volume two. Just make sure that updates correctly. Two. And then the final block is going to contain volume three. And so in the again, in the model tree, we see we've now created blocks with volume that contains volume one, two, three. Going back to our materials, we can now associate a material with these blocks by selecting material and then assign material. Um, and I think this is a, a really nice way to be able to perform this material assignment. We have like a library or a selected set of materials that we can pretty quickly assign to the blocks that we'd like. So if we look at block one, this was for volume one, we'll assign it our uranium oxide. Block two will be assigned the cladding material, zircaloy. And block three will be assigned the water material. And that's, that's all that's required for material assignments in Diagram C. And the next thing that we'll move on to is assigning boundary conditions. So this is done instead of have, through the volumetric blocks, um, we're going to be assigning our boundary conditions using side sets. So the first thing that we'll do is go ahead and create a new side set. Again, the IDs here um, for side sets are not important, but the name in this case is. Uh, we want to be able to indicate that this is a boundary condition, and we can do that with this prefix that is boundary colon, and then the type of boundary condition that it is. So in OpenMC, we can support things like a transmission boundary, um, which is your standard default boundary condition, vacuum boundary condition, or reflecting boundary condition, which is what we'd like to apply here today. We talked about the fact that um, we're dealing with a finite model in the Z dimension. And so to represent an equivalent 2D model using DAGMC, we're going to need to apply this boundary condition to the surfaces on the top and the bottom of the geometry. So I'll go in and I'll go ahead and select all of those surfaces. And then we're going to go ahead and create this new side set with the name boundary reflecting. And we can just click on it to double check. These are the set of surfaces that are associated with that side set. So equally, in the DAGMC model, or sorry, in the uh, OpenMC model, so I go back to this uh, description of the surfaces, we see we also have reflecting boundary conditions. Um, on the X and Y planes of our model. So we're going to want to apply those as well. This model is just in, to indicate kind of an infinite C of pin cells in X and Y with no limit in the Z direction. So we're going to go ahead and say uh, surface all visibility on. So we can see those two surfaces we turned off when we were examining the topology. And then um, we are going to say side set one add surface. And then let's find out what these surfaces are. Um, 
I, I'm not an expert Qubit user. There's people on the phone call here who are much more uh, efficient than I am at some of this stuff, but uh, this is how I would probably approach that is to select these surfaces and just see in the console output what the IDs are so you can add them to the side set. So here we're going to tell side set one, we're going to add surface 9, 10, 11, and 12. And then we'll go ahead and select that just to make sure. Okay, so all of our exterior surfaces are now reflecting boundary conditions. Um, On to kind of what I think is maybe one of the more powerful um, developments as the result of integrating this DAGMC export capability is the meshing. So now that we have all the metadata assignment that we need for our geometry, we can move on to this meshing. So I'll go ahead and select the mesh tool. And then in DAGMC, we only need the surface to be meshed. So we're going to go ahead and select surface meshing. We'll select um, specify meshing schemes. And here we're going to be looking at the tri-mesh. Uh, DAGMC works with triangles. And so we need to use this uh, something that's going to produce triangles on our surfaces. I'll be using this in particular because of the new set of coarse mesh settings that have been added specifically for DAGMC that allow us to tune um, the variation in size and aspect ratio of the triangles, as well as how accurately they resolve the curvature of surfaces um, through this deviation angle here. Um, so we'll leave that as it is for now, it's just fine. Uh, we're gonna be applying this meshing routine to all surfaces in, the deck, uh, in our geometry. We'll apply that scheme and then just for some contrast, historically, the way that we've interacted with the DAGMC model export would be to write something into the console um, that looks like this, you know, type in export DAGMC, my file, and we specify our parameters for that file here and things like that. And then the file would be generated um, and it became essentially what is a black box where the faceting is kind of unknown or the triangles are kind of unknown, what they look like, what their shapes are um, and things like that. And then it would be handed off to the Monte Carlo uh, for run. It's not to say that this wasn't robust, but it is nice to be able to see the actual faceted geometry, which we can do with Qubit using this tri-meshing scheme. And I can visualize the, the triangle that the transport algorithm will actually see in, uh, in simulation. So uh, another benefit of this is, let's say I'm not really happy with how surfaces uh, was meshed. I can remesh this and say, all right, I would like my you know, deviation angle to resolve curves a little bit better here. So maybe I'll turn that down to something like two um, and just remesh that single surface um, and get a different tessellation. Uh, you're not limited to the coarse mesh settings. These were specifically added for DAGMC, but if I were to, you know, turn those off and just use some default settings for its angle, uh, angle face here, then we would get a totally different tessellation of that surface. So it just gives us a, a, a whole bunch of knobs to turn in terms of adjusting the fastening for accuracy and performance, which is really nice. Um, model export has also been integrated into the into the GUI as well. So now that we have a mesh on this and we have our metadata assignments, exporting the model, we can go to either file and hit export here or use the export icon that's in our toolbar. So I'll go ahead and navigate to our working directory here for this core form, DAGMC webinar, and I have a little folder dedicated for doing my work. So we'll just call this pincel.h5m. And then I can save this file. Uh, typically, there's a dialog box here that will enable some additional options. Um, and that has yet to be populated. We're going to be kind of iterating on this um, feature back and forth between uh, myself and the team at Coreform going forward to improve usability. And here we have the result of this where we've written this file to our location uh, where we're going to be working. And if I list my directory here that we're working in, I guess I need to move into the pen cell directory first. We'll see, we now have this pen cell uh, model that is our DAGMC model. So one thing that um, 
I really like to do, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and exit the Python interpreter, is to check whether or not this model has become watertight um, as on export. Uh, the nice thing about this also that I should say is the expectation is the models will be watertight on generation inside of Qubit, whereas there was an additional step essentially necessary that could happen as part of the export, but uh, that would happen to seal the model. And as part of that, um, we expect that the edge of each triangle at the boundary of a surface has a corresponding edge in the mesh topology. And so there's no like floating point difference between those edges. They are in fact the same edge of the triangles and this allows for robust transport. It's a little bit down in the weeds, I apologize, but uh, it is really important. Um, yeah, it's, it's, all, uh, it's really important for robust transport. And so we have these algorithms, these tools that are part of DAGMC that can check the water tightness of the resulting file that we just generated. And sure enough here we see, without having to perform an additional sealing step, um, we have a watertight model according to this checker algorithm. All right, so with that, I'll jump back into Python. We're gonna import OpenMC, and let's go ahead and actually uh, use apply this geometry in an OpenMC simulation. So we'll get our example model that we had before. We're gonna tweak some settings just so that we converge the model well enough uh, that we really convince ourselves that you know these solutions uh, are unbiased between the CSG geometry and the DAGMC geometry. So we'll run um, 10,000 particles per batch in our K effective or eigenvalue simulation. Or we can go ahead and run 100 batches in total. And we'll run 10 inactive batches before tallying or gathering any statistical information to allow our fission source to uh, converge. Okay, so first things first, uh, we'll go ahead and run the CSG geometry in OpenMC. So this will take just a little bit. We can see here, uh, it's telling us it's loading cross-section data. It's initializing the, the first set of source particles, and then it's doing 10 batches without tallying the neutron multiplication factor or any other tallies in the simulation. And then it started to uh, accumulate that info, and we see that the error is kind of dropping iteration by iteration. And when we're done, we get a bunch of information on the timing and the particle rates and then the different uh, K-effective or neutron multiplication factor um, estimators that we use in the simulation. All right, cool. So that's a standard OpenMC simulation. Let's learn how to apply the STAGMC geometry inside of OpenMC. Um, that is as simple as creating an object that is a DAGMC universe and then providing the file name that you want um, that you want to use for that DAGMC geometry. And so a universe in OpenMC is a way to essentially have a, set, a contained set of geometry uh, that you can insert inside of other CSG cells. And hopefully I'll have time to kind of demonstrate as well later on. So we can create one of these. OpenMC can provide us a little information about it um, as well. I think in cells. Oh, uh, I was too ambitious there. So we'll skip that piece. Oh, I'm not in the right directory. Am I? Sorry about that. Pick up. Uh, so the DAGMC universe has our cells in it. And then we can go ahead and apply this pretty easily by just replacing the root universe that was our CSG universe. If we look at what that is now, we'll see it's a geometry type CSG and it has our three cells in it. We can replace that with the DAGMC universe instead. And then if we've done everything correctly, with the same set of uh, settings that we had before. Oh, maybe I misspelled something here, sorry. Uh, yeah, I had a space in the name. Uh, so this is one of the gotchas, I guess, is like, you gotta make sure if you're doing uh, assignments by name that you, know, you, you get all your characters right. So we'll go ahead and remove that character in our material assignments, and we should just be able to re-export re this model. Uh, 
All right. So we've done that. That model is just associated by file name. And so if I try to rerun this, there we go. We'll see, we've corrected that material assignment. And now there's a couple of indicators that convince us that we are in fact running a DAGMC geometry here in the OpenMC output. Uh, we see this additional line that says we're loading the H5M file. Uh, this information that we're initializing the DAGMC geometry query tool, that it's building ray tracing acceleration st structures, and then this kind of warning about uh, the graveyard volume in the DAGMC model. We've applied boundary conditions entirely to the outside of this model, so we don't need to worry about this warning simulation or this warning message. But um, I'll kind of explain what what it's trying to tell us here. Um, as we move on to the Paramac model. The other indicator is it takes a little bit longer <laughs> to run a DAGMC simulation compared to CSG. We're using a triangulated surface representation instead of these relatively simple CSG equations. And so the ray tracing processes behind all this can take some more time. But again, the advantage here is really the flexibility in the geometry description and the ability to represent higher order surfaces in DAGMC. Would now be a good time to ask you a question, Patrick? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this is from Nicholas. Looking at the coarse mesh generated, that's somewhat counterintuitive to someone who's used to finite elements. So are there any good best practices about what a good DAGMC mesh should look like? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. This is very counterintuitive to finite elements because what we mostly care about is the proximity of the triangle to the, um, like the, I guess the best description is the farthest distance from the CAD analytic surface to the triangle edges, because that is what's going to affect our estimator, um, our tally estimators in simulation during particle transport. And so, like these, this center surface here uh, provides us with fairly evenly sized triangles. And then we get out here to this kind of fan-like structure. And really the important part for us is that we yeah. have good volume conservation by nature of having enough triangle edges on the outside of this. This is definitely more coarse than you would want if you were trying to really dial down some similarities between these two models. Um, but the internal structure of these triangles across the surface, whether it's this fan-like structure or these, or more evenly spaced kind of meshing like this, is kind of all the same essentially to to DAGMC in terms of the particle transport. Yeah, it is kind of a different paradigm for that. I hope that captured it, Nicola. Please feel free to message me afterwards if I didn't. All right, so I'll go up, I'm just gonna scroll up and see, do I get to keep my output from the previous simulation? So with the CSG simulation, our combined uh, multiplication factor is around here. So 1.16057, and our standard deviation for that uh, measurement is listed here. So a little bit less than 100 PCM uh, for that measurement in the single pin cell. Um, and so we'll let this kind of DAGMC simulation hang out in the background for a little while. I think I was only using two threads on my machine, so it's running uh, slower than it really should. But uh, we see that it is, in fact, converging on something that looks like the same value as our CSG geometry. We can come back and check on that once a little bit. But for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and move on so that we can get to our, uh, hopefully quickly, to our fusion example. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is I'm going to go ahead and save this just in case I want it later. And then I'll reset qubit. So this reset command kind of wipes out pretty much everything. The, the geometry, the blocks, the materials, all the things that we had before. And then we're going to go ahead and cheat just a little bit um, because uh, basically for time's sake. So if I move into the Paramac, uh, folder that we had there. I'm going to load up this model uh, that was generated using Paramac and then imported into Qubit. The material assignments have already been performed for us here. So if I look at all the different regions, we have a whole bunch of structure um, already in place here for us. And then 
Uh, well, it's not quite done yet. I'll go come back to kind of the settings and things like that later that we'll use for the OpenMC simulation. But the real thing that I wanted to kind of talk about with this model was the imprinting and merging when you have a more complex situation. So if I isolate two volumes here, volumes three and seven, and then let's get a transparent view of these, we can see that this diverter volume, volume seven, uh, is coincident with the center stack volume, volume three. And so it's similar to the situation we had before, we had these barrel surfaces or the cylindrical surfaces where um, they're coincident, but this red surface, surface, let's see if I can find it, is coincident, but not along the entire length of the center stack model. I'll find that surface as well. And so, oh, I may have already imprinted and merged this model, but it still suffices for the explanation here. Um, and so what's happened here is that when we do this imprint and merge step, this surface that this was in one large surface um, of the center stack here on the outside, when the imprinting and merging occurred, that surface was broken up into several different surfaces that were added to this volume. Um, and that is uh, again, important because now we know that if a particle exits through this exterior surface of the center stack, that it's going to go into different volumes depending on which surface it goes through. And so by having that imprint and merge step done, we can see that you know, if, we, if this particle is moving through surface 42 and it was in the center stack volume, then logically the only place for it to go is into the diverter when we're looking at it from a particle transport perspective. And that's exactly how DAGMC is going to transfer that particle from volume to volume. So that probably works out fairly well. It saves us a little bit of time to skip the kind of imprinting and merging. Um, and you can see down here on the bottom of this, there's another diverter volume that we had as well. Um, and the same processes occurred there where the surface was inserted to match that, uh, that space where those surfaces were coincident. So we'll turn the visibility of our volumes back on. So we can see our whole model, make it solid again. And now, since our imprinting and merging is already done as well, um, we can talk a little bit about running this model in isolation, kind of as the only piece of the geometry. If we were to hand this off to um, OpenMC, there's a couple ways to proceed forward. We could define vacuum boundary conditions on all of the exterior surfaces, which is one way to do that. Um, we can also insert this into a CSG cell that has surfaces with vacuum boundary conditions, which is what we'll do in just a moment. Um, but I did want to talk about the nuance in running this kind of a model with MCMP or um, another Monte Carlo code just briefly. So in order to do that in MCMP, the way that particles are terminated is an exterior cell is required um, with, a, um, with a certain condition on it that tells MCMP that the particles have essentially exited the model and they're no longer important to the statistics of the model. And so we can create that, uh, that region by creating, typically we'll use a uh, prism volume or a brick, and we're just make it long on, or large enough to contain the entire geometry. Um, so we'll go ahead and set this to, just getting an idea for the size of this. We'll say the width is something like 1400. Um, and this is kind of shorthand for making it a width of 1400 units in all three dimensions. In the console, we just type in create brick x1400 and it uses that for all three dimensions. So we'll create a volume that contains everything and then we'll create one that's slightly larger than that as well. So we can create kind of this, whoops, larger, smaller, this kind of shell volume around the outside of that. And then just like before, what we would do is subtract the two new volumes that we made. So we would take 19, we'll subtract away 18, we don't need to keep any of the originals in this case. And then that would give us, if I section this view, that's gonna give us the shell that goes around it. And what we would do is we would assign a material to that that is called the graveyard. So this is a, a uh, 
conventional term within our field for the place where particles go to be terminated uh, is the graveyard. And so we would add this material, we put this volume in a block just like we do for any of the other volumes, but OpenMC will interpret this as a void region with vacuum boundary conditions. MCMP will, uh, DAGMC will convey this information to MCMP in the sense that this is the place where particles have zero importance and that's where they kind of go to be terminated. So again, um, I'll maybe as part of the post, uh, when we put this webinar up, we'll add a link into these kind of Monte Carlo code specific steps for, for model generation. So that, um, that's a little, there's another reference there to, to follow. So I'll go ahead and delete that volume. We really just want to kind of deal with what we already have in this geometry for the purpose of today. And then we'll create a new mesh. And similar to before, we're just going to create um, a mesh with all. We'll go ahead and use our course mesh settings feature. Apply the scheme. And we'll mesh the model. So it looks like there's um, some kind of small overlapping surface here. We'll go ahead and make sure that the model is watertight after we've meshed it to just convince ourselves that that's really OK. It does happen sometimes, but it's not always of consequence. Um, in the DAGMC simulations. So here's our model. And we'll go ahead and export that. And we'll try to wrap up in the next couple of minutes here so that we can have some time for discussion. But I'll export that, yes, to this directory. Save it. And we'll finish that up. Okay, sorry for the context switch here, but just wanted to note that we have finished our DAGMC simulation and we're well within reason um, within one standard deviation for the uh, simulation between CSG and DAGMC. Um, okay, so now that we've done that, We'll go into the Paramac folder. I'm going to open a Python um, terminal. And we're just going to take a look at one or two things before we visualize this uh, model as OpenMC would see it. So we are going to essentially tell OpenMC to gather together a model object from all of the different XML inputs that we have here for the geometry, the materials, and settings, and the tallies that we want to apply. We can look at the geometry of this model and at the root universe of it. And we'll see that we have a CSG universe as the root. Um, but we want to use DAGMC. So this might be a little bit counterintuitive. However, if we look at the cells of this universe, we see that we have one cell that uh, contains a, a region. This region, just for the sake of time, can, is a rectangular prism that encompasses the tokamak model. The other cell is a region that encompasses essentially what would be the other half of this tokamak model. And then it, is a ro it takes the contents of that cell and rotates them by 180 degrees. So the idea here is that we have about half a token, uh, well, if I was exactly half a tokenmac model. In OpenMC, we can take and insert this geometry as a universe and repeat it, translate it, and rotate it um, as we like to generate a 360 degree model. And that's what this has done here is we have one section that contains the DAGMC geometry as is. So if we look at the fill of, uh, let's see, cell 42, we'll see that this is in fact our DAGMC universe as that tokamak geometry. And then in the other cell, we have that same geometry shifted over like the cell inside of that cell, but rotated um, 180 degrees. So to convince ourselves that that's truly the case, we're gonna go ahead and load up a utility that's the OpenMC plotter. It's too many threads. Um, the OpenMC plotter. And so what it's gonna do is display this model for us as OpenMC would see it. And 
And there we are. So we can see that we now, rather than just having half of the tokamak model, we've taken it and inserted it into two different cells so that we have a 360 degree model. So this is a nice way to take advantage of symmetry in your geometry if you have it, and it reduces the footprint of your, um, of your geometry considerably in memory because now we just have half of the, um, sorry, we have half of the DAGMC model that we would have if, as if we had like a full 360 degree CAD. So this, I'll execute a simulation at the end of this, but I also just wanted to show, um, you can then examine results. I kind of have some pre-computed results here, again, cheating for the sake of time a little bit, um, where you can load tally information into this, um, from this geometry. And you can do things like filter by different regions here. Um, so if we load up that, uh, I'm going to turn it, I'm actually going to turn the tally off for just a second and kind of page around just to show that this is a nice way to confirm that our materials have wound up where we think they are. We have some tungsten out here. Um, we have our blanket material of the lithium lead and some vacuum vessel steel on the outside. But we can load our uh, simulation results up here and visualize them here as well. You can also do this sort of thing in pair of view, but this is just kind of our limited native functionality uh, for this plotter in OpenMC to show you that it does in fact uh, contain the geometry that we, that we think it does. So I think with that, I'll kind of run this as we're, uh, this simulation that I promised as we're talking in the background here, but let's open it up for questions, I guess, with the limited time we have available in the background. Great. Patrick, thank you so much. And on this note, uh, anyone is welcome to request a free trial of Coreform Qubit to test out these workflows for themselves. And then um, at coreform.com, we have a form where you can ask questions about that workflow. Um, where we look forward to supporting you. Um, okay, great. Number of questions. Maybe, uh, let's see, we'll start with this one from Ibrahim. How do you get the 3D flux, fission, or energy deposition if you're only meshing the surfaces? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, sorry, I didn't have time to go into that in more detail, but I can kind of explain here in just a second. Uh, so maybe I can just do that on a different. So we can define um, user defined tallies for OpenMC models. And so if we look at this uh, tally object. So we have a tallies.xml file. So you can look at that in its raw form, but it's not to me as informative immediately, but essentially what it contains is a, a regular mesh over the entire model with 200 voxels in each, each direction. Um, so, and, whoops, index two, zero. Um, and so this tally that we defined has both a material filter and a mesh filter on it. So it's tallying into separate data sets based on the material that particles are going through, as well as the different mesh voxel that it's going through. And then two different scores are scored as well, both the flux um, and the heating. And if we look at the filters, we can see you know, we have this mesh filter and this material filter um, where it's sectioning the materials out um, over the different material IDs listed here. So that's kind of the short version. I think maybe as part of the video, we can also post a lot of the example notebooks that will cover material like for OpenMC specifically. Great, thank you. Um, along those lines, are there any complete tutorials or documentation available on this currently available? And I'm assuming it refers to the, the entire DAGMC workflow. Um, I guess it's it's sort of in pieces <laughs> right now. So the, the DAGMC model generation workflow, I am currently in the process of creating tutorials for um, for the qubit side of things. And then um, for using DAGMC geometry and OpenMC, there are a number of example uh, notebooks available that go over how to apply these things in, in more detail than I had time for today. We can, we can post links to those on our form after the webinar. Yeah. 
Um, okay, question from Alex. Um, thanks for the interesting webinar. There are potentially hundreds of surfaces that need to be defined as reflecting for sector models in Fusion. Is there a better way to capture these than manually defining, which can be error prone? Yeah, um, I would. What I would recommend is so. That's a really good question. So if we look at the surfaces um, of this geometry for this problem, let's see. So there were like the X planes here on the lower side and high side of the model. Then we have one bisecting plane through the Y plane that was transmission. But like, if you wanted to represent this model equivalently, what I would do is create a CSG cell with a plane that lines up with the face, kind of this bisecting face of the tokamak, and then change that boundary condition to reflecting. And then you can drop the Dagum C model in, in that way. There's probably also better ways to like go about selecting a set of surfaces that like line up with a plane like that and cube it. Um, I'm not, you know, again, I'm not like a full-on qubit power user or expert. I wouldn't claim that. So, yeah. so what, what you can do is um, if you issue a command, say, uh, side set one, add surface all with, and you can see here, it looks like it's aligned with the Y axis. So you can say surface all with Y underscore chord less than, yep, so Y chord, so Y underscore chord. Okay, got it less than symbol say one e one e minus six just to get just above zero and so then that has now automatically grabbed them. nice and of course you could also use the python interface with qubit if you're doing these journal files in python you could then use sophisticated python routines to say um you know find all of like cylindrical surfaces or something like that so you can get really sophisticated great thanks that's great vernon Hope you know that. Thanks, Greg. Um, okay, Patrick, is there an option in OpenMC to export geometry as CAD so that Cuba can generate meshes for other applications like CFD? That's a really good question. Um, in short, no, not right now. Um, what does exist? We can do this with MCMP, and there's actually that has. This is a whole other webinar, so maybe we could call this a teaser or something. I don't know. But uh, the, the ability to import MCMP geometry into CAD uh, has also been integrated as well. And so what we can do is get CSG into CAD um, using that format. But for OpenMC, we don't yet support that. If I'm not sure if I totally understand this question, but if Qubit has all surfaces, is it always necessary to mesh a model? to run OpenMC DAGMC model. Qubit has all surfaces. I don't quite understand it's, either. Like as, it, as if they were all shell surf or shell volumes or something along those lines, perhaps? Yeah, or maybe just is it, is the meshing, maybe there's the meshing step required. Um, ah, I see. Um, yes, yeah, it, it currently is. The H5M file is a, a mesh-based format. So the triangles are going to need to be present as part of that. We can't, once that H5M file exists, DAGMC just ingests it, the mesh as it is. It won't, it doesn't have any like generation capability. Incorporated. Yeah, great. Um, thank you everyone for attending the webinar. There's a number of other questions that we haven't had, a, had the time to address. Um, yeah. Um, what we'll go ahead and do is, copy these and post them on the uh, and po post them with answers on the core form form and then drop a link uh, to that to everyone that attended the webinar. So again, Patrick, thank you very much for your time and helping. I mean, first of all, being a developer of both DAGMC and OpenMC, and then also helping us um, get this better integrated to make this more accessible to the community and for your time with the webinar. Thanks everyone for attending and um, we'll talk to you all later.